Now, yesterday, the government finally unveiled its long-awaited energy security strategy, amid the energy market being squeezed in Europe. Central to the plans is the government's hope to bring about a third era of nuclear energy, moving from our anemic pace of building just one reactor a decade up to one every single year. Well, to talk through the implications of this, I'm joined by Rear Admiral Michael Hewitt, the CEO of IP3 Security. IP3 Security helps to bring safe and secure nuclear power to the international market. Rear Admiral Hewitt has recently contributed to a report on the UK's energy security with former Defence Secretary Liam Fox. Uh, Michael, welcome to the programme. This has been a long time coming. Whilst the review took over a month to be uh, published and the strategy is finally in our hands, the government had been signalling that it wanted to expand nuclear energy since the summer. Uh, is it exactly what we expected? I, I think in some ways it is. And if you look at the 10-point plan, the energy white paper and the RAB model and the prime minister's support to net zero at COP26, you could see this coming because up until this point, energy was being defined by climate policy and not energy security. So with a kind of fresh view on the energy mix here in the UK, obviously being driven a lot by what we're seeing happen in Ukraine, nuclear power rose to the fore. We're not surprised by that at all. It contributes to decarbonization, but moreover, it contributes to the UK having its own indigenous energy source, which is a premium now. So I like the idea that we're talking about energy, not from climate policy, but from national security. And of course, with nuclear power, there's the added bonus that it is a low carbon or zero carbon, however you want to phrase it. It's, it's not a hydrocarbon uh, source of energy. Uh, it, it is, however, quite expensive and does take quite some time to get up and running, uh, a lead in time of over 10 years to create a new nuclear power station. Is there a worry that this strategy is not going to do anything for anyone in the short term? I think the strategy, unfortunately, has something for everyone, which usually means it has something for no one. In this particular case, continuing to rely heavily on renewable energy, particularly wind, which we've seen over the last six or seven years, has really created the energy crisis that you have in the UK today. And to blame the Russian invasion of Ukraine for the energy crisis is very short-sighted. So we have to really focus in on bringing affordable nuclear power, which can be done. We did it in the 70s. Rolls-Royce in particular, um, who builds for your UK Navy, uh, has an SMR program that we think can is get the, the market. small modular reactors. Correct. The small modular reactors, which actually complement renewable energy much better. The large construction projects of Hinkley Point and others really have run their course. We're not doing them except for one location in the United States. Really, Russia and China dominate that industry now. So we have to go back to focusing on what kind of nuclear power fits for the U.K. model. And we think a U.K.-built, U.K.-branded company such as Rolls-Royce complementing the renewable energy and a commitment to fossil fuel. I think what we've all realized is that getting out of fossil fuel as a way to push towards renewable energy doesn't work. So I really like the fact that we're going back to oil and gas. I think we should be doing more in fracking here mm -hmm. in the U.K., but the point is you need to have your own source of energy so that you can control the outcome of your prices and actually the jobs in the manufacturing that need to come along with it. Boris Johnson likes to say that the United Kingdom is the Saudi Arabia of wind, of offshore wind, I should say. The strategy doesn't have that much to say about new onshore wind, but it looks like we will be building more offshore wind. Certainly, it's, a lot of a, it's much of a cheaper technology than it used to be. It does provide uh, good energy, but it's intermittent. And so the big problem there is how do you have the baseload power? How do you uh, either have storage uh, or, or make sure that you can have a free flow of energy when the wind isn't blowing? And it, it, while, we don't have, while we won't have new nuclear for some time, how do we fill that gap? Well, I think you fill the gap with gas. You go back to recognizing that fossil fuels are part of a transition plan. And, and the capacity factor issue with renewable energy, which operates around 30 to 35 percent, which means 65 percent of that capacity is unused. And so recognizing that going to 50 gigawatts of wind really doesn't mean you get 50 gigawatts of baseload. It's just the opposite. But with nuclear power, for every gigawatt you build, that is an actual gigawatt of always on emissions free power. And then on top of that, it's the kind of electricity that new industries are looking for because it's not intermittent. Mm -hmm. Big data industries, 
oil refineries, hydrogen production, they like clean power. Anything that you do these days better say green, mm -hmm. but it better be baseload power to produce that kind of application. So I think we are continuing to overcommit to renewable energy, recognizing that that is the source of much of your problems mm -hmm. today. If you go back to 2020 and you look at some of the, the energy shortages you had, it was really driven by the fact that the wind wasn't blowing sufficiently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the wind blows too much. So I think you have to balance the renewables with the baseload, and nuclear is your baseload balance. The strategy does have something to say about hydrogen. And there are different types of hydrogen. There's dirty hydrogen, there's green hydrogen. Um, green hydrogen is when you use those uh, renewable energy sources to then convert the energy they make into hydrogen and then use that. But that, that's pretty inefficient. It loses about 50% of the energy that you collected in the first place. What are your thoughts on leaning into hydrogen as that sort of storage capacity? Well, I think if, if the prime minister thinks that wind is going to be the Saudi Arabian equivalent for the UK, you have to be able to distribute that energy. Hydrogen becomes that source of energy that you can produce with green sources of power, such as wind, mm. and then be able to distribute it to the applications and export it. The problem is with renewable energy, as the source of power, it's very inefficient for producing the hydrogen. So the cost is, is way higher. But again, with a nuclear power plant, because it's always on, I can match it up to the application, drive down the cost of producing that hydrogen, and it still is green hydrogen. Mm. It, any other form of hydrogen that's not green is really not effective to the decarbonization plans of the country. Well, it's probably counterproductive because not only are you not putting in green energy to make that hydrogen, but you're losing a lot of that energy along the way, the, the sort of waste that's created there. Uh, what, I, again, all of this uh, conversation seems to be looking at what's going to be happening in the next decade. It would have been very, very sensible for governments to bring forward the, a British energy security strategy 10 or 20 years ago, but we're, we are where we are. I, I suppose to some extent, uh, politicians might not be thanked for this, even if it helped us in a decade's time. Well, I think you look at what Tony Blair did when he really took a very smart and sound energy strategy with nuclear power, fossil fuels, and renewables coming in as an augment to the baseload. And unfortunately, it flipped around, mm. and renewables became the sole focus for decarbonization. And we realized that's put us in the predicament that we're in, not just here in the UK, but throughout Europe. Mm. And so I think it's really smart, and it's time to make a very hard decision, which is to commit back to more carbon-based fuel as a transition plan, but make nuclear power. And I like the idea of 25% of the power generated in the UK coming from nuclear because that'll generate over 60% of your clean power. Mm. So because of the comparison. So I like this plan. It is a bold plan. I think we need to really pay close attention to an overcommitment to renewable energy mm. and go back to the energy security uh, as the key aspect. Just finally in this conversation, how realistic is it that we're going to have a greater sense of energy security, that more of this is going to be coming domestically? Of course, we do import uh, power through uh, interconnectors to the continent. We do import gas, mainly from Qatar and the US. Uh, how realistic is it that we'll enter a new realm of, of somewhat self-sufficiency. Yeah, I think it's important to realize that you're never going to be a hundred percent sourced for your energy. We're too entangled in energy. Energy really operates across borders and you want to have diversity and globalization in your energy. Mm. But you also need to be able to ensure that your, your rate payers and your, and your consumers have safe, reliable energy that invites in new jobs, and new industries and new investment. And I think one of the aspects of this plan is inviting in the private sector to commercialize this. And with nuclear power, we firmly believe these are investable assets, particularly when you tie it to climate change. So I'm very excited about that aspect of the, of the program. Well, welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.